We'd like to carry on then with the um, <clears throat> diversity in higher education. And we have uh, Mr. Joe Samuels from Sakwa. Do we say Sakwa or Sakwa? <laughs> they teach you in Zulu, there are clicks that you must get, get right. Um, welcome, welcome Mr. Samuels. And then Professor Julian Son, uh, whom we had. And then <clears throat> Teresa Oakley-Smith, also a stalwart in the diversity circles. Uh, your company is called Diversity with a T. Very interesting. I would like to encourage you also to move on to the website uh, of uh, Teresa Oakley Smith's uh, diversity website. It's quite stunning. Um, we also had earlier Mandit Mulefi here, also a, a website that I would like to recommend. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, Mr. Samuels, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, I think that this is quite an important uh, discussion uh, that we are having, uh, you know, this afternoon and, of course, started this morning. Um, I wanted to also say that apart from, you know, my professional interest um, in working at the South African Qualifications Authority, this is also a very important discussion for me because um, I've got a young daughter that is uh, finishing her... Um, medical um, studies this year and I must say that you know she was one of those students who only got the 70 percent you know in matric and so on and because of the policies of you know allowing uh, people in um, she got a chance to um, you know to, to to get in at University of Pretoria and in fact you know she's completing this year and I think she will be a very very good uh, young doctor uh, and, and cares tremendously about people and so on. So it's not only for me about <clears throat> that you must have 90, 100% and so on, but it's also looking at the whole question about, you know, she's a young, she's a young woman, um, you know, and she comes from, from a kind of different background to, to the people who traditionally was at the University um, you know, of Pretoria. So the question that um, um, I was asked to address is diversity in higher education, where are we and where are we going? Um, so given that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and also how far, um, you know, if we then say that how far we come, we actually need to look at, um, you know, where we are coming from. Now, we, we all know that in, in uh, South Africa, uh, social inequalities are embedded and is reflected in all spheres of social life. And that um, is in the social, political and the economic discrimination and inequalities of race, class, gender, institutional and spatial nature that this profoundly shaped and continue to shape South African higher education. So poverty and inequality and class difference are everywhere. In addressing these aspects of our society, government and all stakeholders need to enable development where it is most needed for the majority of people in the country, while also enabling cutting edge development. So the challenge then for all of us, including higher education, is to narrow the overall range of social privilege while not losing the cutting edge, not leaving anyone behind and creating developmental opportunities at every turn. That is a huge, huge challenge that, 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 that we're faced with. And you can't just do it, you know, you must do it at the same time. Because otherwise, if we don't do it at the same time, as one of the vice chancellors of another university said, you have what he calls the dialogue of the deaf, where people talk, and it doesn't seem like, you know, we are hearing each other. So, South Africa's democratic government committed itself in 1994 to transforming higher education, including inherited apartheid social and economic structures within and beyond the academy. Since 1994, a range of transformation-oriented initiatives has been underway to effect institutional change. 
Now, <clears throat> I must say, I'm not of the view that life was great under apartheid. Because, you know, when I listen to a number of people speaking, it seems like, you know, the past was fantastic. And we're in the present where everything is just going wrong. I don't hold that view. I think life was terrible under apartheid. And I think it is better now. But of course, the point is, is that where we're wanting it to be? And the answer is no, we are not there yet. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think, you know, I, I, it's important for me to, to, to just say that. So the first question then that one needs to pose is, what is diversity and what is transformation in the South African higher education context? Because when one speaks to people, you find that under the rubric of diversity and transformation, there's a whole range of different things that people are speaking about. So for example, um, when some people speak about these terms of diversity, it means increased and broadened participation. Of course, that is an issue. And let me just, you know, sketch in broad terms what the situation is that we find ourselves in. If one looks at universities in general, you'll find there's about a million uh, people in higher education, million students in higher education. Um, but if one looks at the other sectors, the other part of the higher education sector, or as the minister called it, the post-school sector, our colleges, for example, it started out in 1994 with about, in the region of about 300,000 students. Now we've got something like 650,000 students. But we also know that in a society like ourselves, it is quite important that you should have more students that goes to those colleges, you know, then go to university. Otherwise, I mean, you, you see this, um, you know, the kind of uh, 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 turnaround pyramid, as it were. So, so the point is, and the Green Paper in Education speaks about this, where there's not enough places of learning that we have across the system. So it is imperative that we actually broaden um, you know, what is happening. And we must broaden participation, but also make sure that access for black women, access for black people, and I'm using black now in the, in the, not in the apartheid sense of the word, women, disabled and mature students, and that there are fair chances of, of success to all while eradicating all forms of unfair discrimination and advancing the redress of, uh, of past inequalities. <clears throat> the point, though, is, you know, you can bring people into a, into a system, and then the question, what then? Um, this, the Council on Education released a report where, where they were saying that 50% of people in the first year drop out, of, drop out in terms of their courses. So, so you can provide access, but you must be able to make sure that people are able to stay in the system, as it were. Otherwise, you know what, 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 what it is that, in fact, that we are doing. So the second point then is diversity in organizational form and, institutional, and in the institutional landscape is also quite important. People also speak about the mix of institutional missions and programs, that those things need to change. And then, of course, under diversity, also people speak about the democratic ethos and the culture of rights. Furthermore, an enabling institutional environment that is sensitive and affirms diversity, promotes reconciliation and respect for human life, protects the dignity of individuals from racial, sexual harassment, and in fact, rejects all forms of, of behavior. So, so there's a broad range of things under, under that heading, you know, as one talks about it. Now, if we speak about institutional diversity, um, <clears throat> there are two related initiatives in higher education. Institutional restructuring, which has reduced 36 higher education institutions to 23, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we have 11 universities, um, six comprehensive, and then six universities of technology um, included in that, and the negotiation of academic offerings or program or qualification mixes. Some have embraced these changes, but in fact, you know, there's also been resist resistance in terms of the sector. Higher education um, 
institutions in the country are far more diverse than were they, that they were in 1994. But while institutional diversity is necessary, it is not a sufficient condition, in my view, for transformation. If we talk then further about diversity in terms of institutional purpose, what is the progress there? Now, um, there has been a, a white paper on higher education in 1997, which has located higher education within a broader and a larger process of political de democratization, economic restructuring and development, and redistributive social policies aimed at equity. Increasingly, however, we see that the trend has been to approach higher education and investments in universities from the perspective largely of promotion of economic growth and the preparation of students for the labor market uh, and as productive workers within our society. If we talk about a diversity of knowledge and intellectual spaces, again, I think this is quite important because we must allow for the different views you know, to, to go through. And I would also like to argue here that, Sakwa, <clears throat> that South Africa needs to embrace and engage with indigenous African knowledge because if we don't create space, any serious agenda of inclusivity in higher education entails the duty of using the powers conferred by academic freedom to substantially decolonize, deracialize, and degender our inherited um, uh, intellectual spaces. Uh, yesterday, there was also a huge uh, seminar that was organized by the Council on Education. And it basically focused on the degree structure. Now, for the last 100 years, the degree structure in the country has remained the same. And it was, and that degree structure, in fact, is something that we've borrowed from Scotland. So the question is, in a way that, that, that they were posing is, does that degree structure work for South Africa? And if it's not working, you know, what is so holy about it that we can't change it? So, what does transformation mean? And it is not only, as I said earlier, about race or racial representativity or racial access, but it's about knowledge and it's about knowing. It is about opening spaces where people from all walks of life are welcome and where engagement with diverse ideas is possible. The substance of transformation is working for the public good. Social interest above self-interest and above group interest, above sectional interest beyond race, class, gender, language, age, religion, and so on. Transformation is about an attitude and approach. It does not have the kind of limits sometimes that we impose on it. Now, <clears throat> what are some patterns that we have seen over time in terms of what are we doing? Um, as I said, if one looks at the patterns of um, access that quite clearly, in fact, access have improved. Um, but if we talk about success, then you would see that 5% of the cohort of learners classified black entering school in any one year progress to actually graduate at the university, while some 60% of their white counterparts complete university successfully. So it's a huge kind of gap. <clears throat> so throughput statistics at one uh, institution, for example, show that while 70 to 80% of students classified as white graduated in commerce, science, and engineering between 2006 and 2009, only between 50, 56 to 64% of those classified as, as, as black graduated in these subjects in the same period. Now, if one looks at doctoral studies, the stats also, you know, is, 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 is frighteningly low. So the questions about success, I think, is, is a crucial thing. Now, so the students and the staff profiles, you know, is clearly unsatisfactory at the moment. And we need to do something seriously, um, you know, about that. So, so we need to f focus on issues of social inclusiveness. But more um, useful, perhaps, is to focus on 
the social dynamics within higher education. What happens to diverse people when they find themselves in the commons of university? One needs to look at who the diverse people are and at the differing and complex ways in which people take and make identity. Second, while there is social inequality, social injustice, and a need for social redress, there's also the need to question, um, you know, the kind of epistemic um, uh, edifice of the university and the relationship between the social and the epistemological, uh, as it were. We must not forget the questions that our knowledge and the social and, and organizational forms which emanate from particular conceptualizations. So what is then being done to move us towards diversity? Now, I've got a whole number of different initiatives, you know, that I've just listed and so on. And uh, um, so in other words, it's not that nothing is being done. Um, for example, and I will use one or two, there's a ministerial committee into the transformation and social cohesion in higher education. Um, there was a higher education summit that was done in 2010. Um, there were symposiums on transformation, summits on indigenous language. And in fact, the earlier point that I've made about increased participation, we have now an NSFAS that spends over eight billion on, on bursaries per year, you know, in terms of um, making access more, more important the Charter for Humanities and Social Sciences, and so on. Um, apart from uh, the initiatives from, from the departments, there's also initiatives outside of the state, the anti-racism workshops, the HESIS transformation task teams, and so on. And then I think that a number of higher education institutions the, through, the, through the vice chancellors have taken a huge number of initiatives. For example, at Rhodes, there's the interrogation of what a higher education can be. And uh, this year, the NRF made one of the people from Rhodes, you know, their, their, their uh, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award person, uh, which was an African woman. And in fact, when she received, um, you know, her Lifetime Award, there were something like 10, 12 doctoral students, you know, that she has been working with that came through. Um, there's a whole number of other uh, you know, a number of other initiatives. Uh, there's initiatives in terms of language, in terms of teaching, and a number of student initiatives to take us forward. Um, so the question then is, in brief, the following I think needs to, you know, uh, is needed. We need to enhance the diversity of institutional forms through careful planning of developmental trajectories and funding support. We need to enhance the diversity of purposes and programs as I outlined already. Um, we also need to make sure that there's diversity for intellectual spaces so that there can be a lot of dialogue. And um, we need to then address the questions about representativity. Um, we need to build knowledge and, and pedagogical skills. And we must try to see whether we can't encourage collaboration much more. And as I said, if we don't address the inequality within our society, um, we are not going to win this particular one. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> San Bonani to the gentleman sitting over on the right. Um, and uh, salam alaikum. I mean, this is a diversity discussion, is it not? I just apologize to the gentleman here whose language I don't know how to greet him in. I did recognize your point earlier, however. I think it's quite interesting that the, the relationship between what I'm going to say and, and what Joe Samuels has said, because he in a sense has painted the big picture, the macro environment of where we were and where we're going in terms of higher education. I'm working in some institutions of higher education at the moment, and I would like to focus on some of the challenges, enablers, and some of the barriers towards diversity and inclusivity um, that I'm aware of um, and trying to, to help progress in, in such institutions. Um, but first of all, just a little bit about my own background, um, I think is, is quite helpful. Um, I started off teaching at WITS more years ago than I would care to actually mention um, as a psychologist. 
And a couple of years after I'd started teaching, it was during the second state of emergency in the late 80s, I was um, appointed as the first warden of Witt's very first mixed race and mixed gender residence. Now, I'm sure some of you will remember those days, but I seem to remember that nothing prepared me really uh, for the reality of police permanently knocking on the door, going to police stations looking for students, and um, the real difficulties that were experienced by students in those days were a, a complete eye-opener to me. And what I also realized, because it was the first mixed race and mixed gender residence at a time when we still had apartheid in place, was that South Africans just simply didn't know each other at all. We had white students coming into the residence, men and women, who it was the first time they'd ever had a chance to speak to a black peer. And similarly, black students coming in, first time they'd really had a chance to speak to a white peer. It was also the time when the, when the black students' society um, had a policy of not integrating with, with um, university activities as a protest. And so the whole, the, whole, um, the whole time that I spent there, which was a number of years, was very complex and a hugely interesting and exciting and upsetting often learning experience. And it was actually as a result of this learning experience in an institution of higher education that I decided to leave with my, in those days, very paltry pension. I don't know if it's better in, in universities now. And started uh, my own company, which was really directed towards, the broad aim was to help South Africans get to know each other, to, to bring South Africans together. Um, to actually forge a sense of, of unity and a sense of understanding one another. And although it's nearly 20 years later, I, I still feel that we have an enormous amount of work to do in that direction. When I'm on the campuses that I'm working on at the moment, um, it's rare to see mixed race groups of students. It's even more rare to see mixed race groups of staff. I'm not saying that they don't exist, but certainly I think it remains a real challenge. And one of the drivers of transformation and one of the drivers of inclusivity is same status contact. And I would argue that universities are uniquely privileged to be providing that same status contact. And yet somehow they're not doing nearly enough to actually leverage the same status contact that students and staff have. I think one of the challenges in universities as well is not, is not just that one is confronted with what one might call the usual diversity issues. And I think Joe mentioned um, many of them, age, gender, race, religion, sexual orientation and so on. But there's a very real diversity barrier between academic staff and support staff. Where academic staff very often see themselves as above things like, not all of them obviously, but above things like transformation and they see diversity sometimes as a challenge to academic freedom. And then you have support staff who are also, many of them have been there for many years, dominated largely by white females, I say, though I'm a white female myself. And, and the challenge between these two job descriptions is very real, and I think a very significant diversity challenge. Because if one is to bring people together and create a sense of unity in our higher education institutions, one needs to start by bridging the gaps between the people that work there. Um, the, the institutions that I've worked in have been very varied and are very varied, but interestingly enough, the defense, mechanism, the defense mechanisms that are used when one raises issues of inclusivity specifically and creating in the enabling environment that, that, that Joe spoke about earlier. I mean, the classic one that always comes up is that standards will drop standards have dropped. And in fact, what you said about your daughter when you started talking, Joe, was so instructive. And it, it reminds me of what Chris Brink was saying years ago when he was at Stellenbosch, that standards may not be the same when people come in, 
But what we should be aiming for is a situation when standards will be the same when people go out. And that's the challenge, I think, that faces academics and star all, all staff at universities to make sure that those people who come in to do medicine with a 70%, which to me seems pretty and awesome anyway, also have the same opportunity to graduate and become doctors as those who come in with 90% or whatever. So the standards will drop argument is still doing the rounds after all the years. The other common defense mechanism is the reverse racism. And frankly, I see that this is exacerbated by huge ignorance in academic institutions about employment equity. I, I work a lot in business organizations too, and I'm actually struck by how little people working in academia understand about employment equity. So I think there needs to be far more education in those institutions around transformation, but particularly around employment equity, so that the reverse racism argument can be put to bed. There's also the argument or the defense mechanism around reputation. Somehow our reputation will suffer if we transform too rapidly. This is 20 years after we've had a democracy in South Africa. Another very real problem is, is the funding. So many institutions are funded by, ec, by alumni, um, ex-students from the past, who um, want to see the university maintaining the same kind of standing or traditions particularly as it always has had. And so uh, that there's sometimes fear from institutions to change for fear that their funding might also drop. Um, but I think that the talk when we talk of diversity in, in higher education, we should really be talking about inclusivity. The challenge is really, you know, diversity is something in a way that divides us, makes us focus on our differences. You're a man, I'm a woman, you're black, I'm white, you're, you, you have a disability, my disability is not obvious, etc. Whereas inclusivity is about how do we make this institution a place where people can work together, learn together, and be together for the good of the institution, but also to build that sense of inclusivity in our country, which I think is, is so lacking. What seems to be happening at the moment in higher education is that people who are different from the obvious type of students that would have gone to an institution are accepted as long as they're prepared to assimilate. Fit in, be like us, speak our language, look like us, dress like us, and it's fine, you can come in. But if we really want integrated institutions, which will bring creativity and innovation to the fore, then we must get used to bringing in people who are different and allowing them to be different. And I like what you were saying so much about even questioning the, the nature of our degrees, that the length of them, which as you say comes from Scotland. Why is it not possible? There are some sort of things that seem to be impossible to change, but yet would make the most enormous difference if we could change them. The kind of barriers and challenges that I think face many of our higher education institutions, although I should say I'm not talking about the historically black um, educational institutions so much as the historically white or liberal institutions, um, one of the things is their employment equity. Institutions were singled out in the latest Employment Equity Commission report for their very poor compliance and for the workforce profiles which are rather worrying, let me say that. Um, dominated largely by white women who I know are part of the designated group, but possibly not for much longer. But um, they have very, very large percentages of white women and other than that, foreign nationals. <laughs> And we see a situation where in some institutions there are more foreign nationals at the level of professionals than there are Africans from South Africa. And surely that can't, can't be right. I mean, surely that... One isn't saying we mustn't encourage foreign nationals into our institutions. We need scarce skills. We value the perspectives that they bring. But surely our first emphasis should be on developing South Africans to be able to fill those positions. 
Um, other barriers would be the entrenched cultures, the power and dominance of certain languages, um, the failure to recognize the benefits of inclusivity. I mean, an inclusive institution will be one where creativity and innovation can actually flourish. And yet there's still resistance um, in many quarters to um, inclusivity. Um, I think also the failure just to, to understand each other, to take the opportunities to really get to know each other as, as fellow academics or fellows working in a library or an IT section. Not wanting to focus only on the challenges, because obviously there are challenges, and as South Africans in business and institutions, we face them every day. But universities also have some really unique enabling features. First of all, they are a place where people come together at the level of the same status, as academics, as support staff, and particularly as students. So we have the diversity of generation in the same environment, and that should really help us to develop our creativity, innovation, and build a nation through the um, collegiality that can be developed between uh, staff and, and young students at universities. I think um, if, just to look briefly at what, what should we be doing or how could we be doing more or what kind of things could we be doing to improve um, the level of inclusivity at our institutions. I think that first of all, the process of inclusivity itself, it sounds a bit of a conundrum, needs to be inclusive in terms of who it involves. And I, I would suggest that it needs to involve not only staff, academic, support staff, all staff, also students, and hopefully council, alumni, the communities around the universities, so that it is a, a completely incorporated um, environment of people working towards the same level of inclusivity. The process also needs to be a sustainable one, and that suggests the need to develop capacity within the institution to, to, to make sure that the processes that are put in place are sustained going forward. And then where there often seems to be a barrier, except perhaps in the instances of one or two or three very well-known vice chancellors who are working very hard towards transformation, but executives need to be encouraged to really drive the process, not just by sending out communiques and emails, but by getting actively involved in processes that are put in place to transform higher education institutions. And one of the barriers that, that I, um, come across most often is a reluctance of executives, of deans, of heads of departments to actually make the time to get involved um, in, in such a really important um, initiative. The other thing is that universities appear, there may be some that are, but few seem to be actually measuring the performance of people in terms of diversity and inclusivity. There are very well identified skills in managing diversity these days, and many business organizations have trained managers to manage diversity and measure their performance annually in this way. For some institutions, the very notion of measuring performance seems to be something of an anathema. Um, and where it is measured, it very, very rarely includes the important skills of being able to teach people who are different from oneself, being able to mentor, being able to support, being able to provide service to. And I think that's going to be a very key issue going forwards. Um, finally, I think that universities, um, institutions of higher education, colleges too, have a unique opportunity to help us build relationships so that we can actually improve our teaching. And I think that also demands some real introspection about the curriculum. Why is diversity not more in, integrated into all kinds of curriculum? I mean, everything from, educa from education, obviously, but uh, engineering, medicine, all of them require an understanding of diversity, and yet it doesn't seem to be threading through our curriculums. Um, I just will close now because I'm my hobby horse and you can probably see that I could talk all afternoon and 
by which time the whole house would be fast asleep. But just to, to read you something which I think is quite relevant. And this is the reflections of somebody who was at um, one of the higher education institutions. And he says, Despite the university's liberal values, I never felt entirely comfortable there. Always to be the only uh, African, except for menial workers, to be regarded at best as a curiosity and at worst as an interloper is not a congenial experience. And that was the words of Nelson Mandela while he was a student at Wits. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Um, we were concerned that you would not be able to speak a educational language, but you really gave us your insights as a diversity consultant in there and really provided us with valuable insights. Thank you very much. In the similar boat is Professor Son. Over to you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your input, Joe, and thank you, Teresa. My sense of universities is that we need to be aware that they're very much situated in the society we're in. And they're influenced by all the dynamics of the society. I think uh, Joe spoke about the poverty, the unemployment, the joblessness. All those factors impact on the universities. It impacts on who we attract, particularly you know, I'm at a business school where I think we charge 160000 a year. So obviously, the students we attract is very much influenced by the disparities in society. I also find that a lot of schools are directly influenced by the society they're in. There's an excellent school near where I work, Settlers High School. As soon as a certain number of mostly uh, black students entered the school, the white students left. I spoke there recently, I was surprised the student body is primarily black and brown, whereas the faculty continues to be white. And therefore you have that discrepancy, not only you know, along racial lines, but I also think, how can you have a multicultural environment in a setting like that? But so I think the dynamics of society influences what we are experiencing at universities. The dominant culture in South Africa continues to be the white Western European culture. The way that manifests at universities is in the epistemology, what we, the knowledge we create, the way we engage with that knowledge, and our sources of reference. So uh, most of our textbooks are from the States, from Europe. Those are the people we quote. So although we have Africans in the class, it might be difficult for them to resonate. We don't usually use all the... So the universities are very much influenced by these dynamics that's in society. And that Eurocentric position is a major one then part of that Eurocentric position is a high level of individuality. I mean, I was amazed at how we do our own thing at the university. I think that there's a lot of pressure to do research. Research is very much influenced by that. We, had, we just had two guys come from Exeter to spend a couple of weeks with us. During the time that they were there, we had discussion groups. We developed uh, concept papers. Two of my colleagues just presented those concept papers at a, at, a, at a conference. But it was so obvious to me that their style of working in a more engaged manner, in a more inclusive manner, is so different from our style. And I think that really inhibits our ability to really tap on the resources we have. So individualism and that academic uh, elitism still very much characterizes uh, universities. The issue of leadership, I think, just the way we conceptualize leadership, I think also affects the way we operate at universities. I, I mean, I think I was a bit guilty of this as well. 
before I started really engaging with the concept of leader, I didn't think of myself as a leader. I thought of myself as a teacher, a psychologist, later a consultant, but I didn't think of myself as a leader. Neither did I think of myself as a manager. I still struggle with that one. But there's a problem in not taking on that role of I am in a leadership role, but that there's also a mentality of I must also choose to step into a leadership position. And once I step into that leadership position, and I feel like getting up <laughs> as I step into that leadership position. But as you step into that leadership, there are certain demands that you then make on yourself. There's a guy, Quinn, who speaks about the one thing, you must overcome your fear. I think for all sorts of reasons, we are sometimes afraid to step into a leadership position and assume the full responsibility that that would demand of us. So I think the first thing is, when you step into that position, you really need to overcome your fear. The folks that are followers don't expect you to be feeble or to be fearful. He also speaks about, you must really own your integrity. And he has a lovely way of speaking about integrity speaks about integrity as we must close our hypocritical gaps. All of us are hypocrites. All of us have values, but there's a gap between our values and our behavior. You know, recently at a workshop, someone asked, how many of you have gotten speeding tickets lately? And everybody's hands were up, and he said, oh, you're all criminals. But I mean, that's an example of holding a value, but not really acting in accordance with that value. But so all of us are hypocrites. And uh, Quinn's position is, we must consciously close our hypocritical gap. At that moment, we are in integrity. But so it's an ongoing process. And it's an awareness. As we step into a leadership position, we need to overcome our fear. We need to uh, close our hypocritical gaps. We need to be inner directed. I need to be clear what are the values and the principles that I hold dear? What are the values and principles that informs my visions for this class and inform the mission and the purpose? But I need, I need to be clear about that so that, uh, yeah, so that that could be my, 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 guiding, my guiding rod. Secondly, as a leader, I also need to be other-focused. I need to, in a way, overcome my ego. It's not about me. It's about the followers. As a professor, it's about the students. In engaging with you now, it's about you as an audience. So also, in a way, be out of focused And, and I, it's sort of ironical that as soon as we become out of focused we become less fearful because then you're not too concerned about what's the impression I'm making. Sort of get your ego out of the, the way in that way. Also mentions we need to be purpose driven. Now I think in South Africa in general, universities included, we are not always one with what our purpose is. I mean, I think we've got a brilliant, uh, we've got a brilliant uh, constitution and uh, the Constitution very much is an aspirational document. It's not what we've accomplished. It's what we hope to accomplish. So I think that'll be a great framework for us to be purpose-driven in implementing the elements of this Constitution as it applies uh, not only to universities but to education in general. I also think with leadership, we don't realize that leadership is not so much what you say, it's very much who you are. And therefore, we don't always see leadership as, uh, you know, in Mahatma Gandhi's terms, I need to be the change I want to see in the world. And that on all levels, if you want to bring about change in your family, you need to live that change, otherwise it won't be effective. So I've seen a lot of my colleagues who teach in the leadership uh, program, but who don't live the values that they preach. And I think therefore there's that, there's that gap between 
Yeah. Yeah, there's, I was thinking of an example uh, at UJ where we were doing a lot of work around the values. And then when some of the senior managers acted inconsistent with those values, we had to then talk to them and say, nay, you know, it's not working like that. Fortunately, they were very, yeah, let's have to remember, it was difficult conversations, uh, but it was necessary conversations, and I felt they were open to that. With regards to transformation, again, what applies in society, I think, applies to universities. We need to transform this whole mentality about leaders and realize all of us at different stages are in leadership roles and we need to, I think, assume leadership at the university. Universities are still, again, this you know, strong Western influence, very hierarchical. I'm still so amazed that the power that the vice chancellors and the directors have in the institutions. And there's, there's something positive about that. The negative side is all of us in that university, all of us support staff and academic staff, need to assume that role of being leaders once we step into environment. Because the students don't make this distinction. They expect all of us to live the values that we preach. So we've had this uh, dichotomy quite clearly at USB, where in the leadership program we were preaching certain values, integrity being one of them, really what, uh, and encouraging the students to really try that on. Also inclusivity, really for them to push against the tendency that all of us really have to gravitate towards people like ourselves. You know, they call it social identity theory. If someone is like me, I sort of gravitate towards that person, and then I also have a tendency to make positive attributes about those, that person, because usually those things that attracted me are things that I also come from or value, and then I would say, oh, I will hire him, you know, he's so this, he's so that. So we also have a tendency to make positive attributes uh, about these folks. So. We encourage the students consciously to push against the tendencies to gravitate towards people like themselves. But then they'll come back and they say, well, the faculty's not doing it, you know? Those guys only hang out with each other, those guys hang. Now, we don't, go, we don't have a lot of uh, diversity at USB in any case. But so I think also just that notion that we as leaders don't always hold ourselves to the standards that we expect the students or our, our followers to hold. Melissa and I just had a conversation about something that I'm very much aware of, I'm sure all of you are aware of, that most of our universities at present, with two that comes to mind quickly, UCT and Northwest, have uh, black people as chancellors, but other than Professor Mahoba, it's colored people. Is that right? And Adam recently at WITS. Oh, yeah, and, and, you see, and Denisa, of course. In reflecting on that, pun? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. There are many with colored leaders. And I'm just, I want to raise this, and this is a tricky issue. And I think it's a tricky issue because we are reluctant in South Africa to talk about our ethnic identities. You know, and by ethnic identity, I literally mean where are you from, what were your experiences, who were your foremothers and forefathers. And then I also think you usually have a, an emotional attachment to that, positive, negative, and usually positive and negative. So when I think of my ethnicity, I think of growing up in Niveris, colored location, that was definitely that informed me. And then I grew up in apartheid South Africa where Western Cape just started. I attended that school. The rugby I played was in that environment. So those communities definitely informed me. Now, I've lived in the States for 22 years, so I've expanded my sense of identity, and I've really internalized a lot of other identities as well. 
So I feel I'm comfortable being multicultural. And I think in this phase in South Africa, it's possible that those of us who are comfortable being multicultural can play a significant role in encouraging all of us to own our different identities. Because all of us are heterogeneous. You know, you might present now as a white woman, but if we go into foremothers and forefathers, and it's likely that you will realize you're not homogeneous because there's very few homogeneous people. You know, that notion of purity is really a total myth. We are all multicultural. And to the extent that we claim our multiculturalness, we will sort of transform. And I think then we will be more open to that which is African, that which is Indian, that which is Hindu. I want to, yeah, I can also go on about this stuff. I want to conclude on this point. I think a major challenge for us in South Africa and a major element of transformation is the shift from a monocultural to a multicultural society. Now what makes this tricky is African people traditionally who came into sort of respectable leadership positions, not the traditional, not that, were civilized. And civilization was the thing that the, that the English imported. One, you had to be Christian. Two, you had to be educated. Three, you had to be sober. Now, I've hung out on these two. The third one, I'm messing up seriously. <laughs> but you know, that was literally, that was the English civilizing policy. So those early leaders, Dr. Jabavu, Matthews, Chief Latuli, Madiba, all of them come from my parents. My grandfather was the president of the IOTT. The IOTT was an abstinence organization because I think he experienced the devastation that alcohol caused in that Khoisan, Khosa colored community where he grew up. But so if you think about that, all of us were informed by that Western Christian uh, orientation. With the result, none of us, okay, I'm, you could prove me wrong if I'm wrong. None of us were really educated. What does it mean to be an African? What is the African philosophy? What's the African philosophy? What's the African uh, uh, religions? What's the, uh, what's the way that African people lived prior to their contact with whites? Now, it's my sense going through school, I was never exposed to that information. And now we have an expectation that we must create multicultural environments, which would then assume we must hold on to that which is useful in the Western and the European, but also include that which is useful in the, in the African, also include that which is useful in the Indian, both the Hindu and the Muslim. But none of us were really educated in that unless we, we went to another university like in India perhaps and were exposed to that. I mean, I, I was fascinated by this, so I got some exposure about African philosophy and African religions in the States. And I'm saying this because, therefore, the knowledge we are continuing to perpetuate, and Joe's point, even the structures, like the degree structures, these type of classes, these are really terrible classes, you know? I mean, that's why I talk so much. I feel like preaching. Setting. <laughs> you sort of a captive audience. Let's, so let's, I, let's round up now. Okay, I will. <laughs> But so the, the manner in which we teach also obviously need to shift because I think if we value diversity, one, we will insist that, this, that our, our schools and our universities are diverse. But once they are diverse, that we then also need to engage with people differently and get away from the, the more traditional style of engaging. Uh, Just on the last point of your about reverse racism, 
I find it peculiar nowadays. You know, the tricky thing about, particularly I'm talking about white racism now, which continues to be the dominant form of racism because of the power white folks had and still have. Now, there is colored and Indian racism too. I mean, I think we were also raised to think of African people as less than. Oh, please don't talk like Africans, eat like Africans. We were also raised with that mentality. But who feels and knows it, Lord? Bob Marley again, right? Who feels and knows it, Lord? You might say, I'm not racist, or I'm not aware of racism here, because you don't experience it. Then I go into that same environment, I experience it, and I say, oh, Teresa's a racist woman. Then her colleague would say, no, I've never experienced that with her. So the tricky thing about racism is those of us who are affected by it will talk about it. And now, you know, when you do talk about it, white folks sort of just get that glazed look on their face. There he goes again. In fact, let me just stop with the story. I was actually fired recently. I didn't accept it, though. I'm still in the office. <laughs> but, but it's getting tricky. Uh, our director resigned. The dean appointed a small committee of three people, including himself, to be sort of the transition team. And they were all white. And my colleague came into my office all hot and bothered. Uh, so I said, you know, let's not moan and groan. Make an appointment with the dean. Let's go and talk to him. So we made the appointment, went in and told him, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to create uh, an inclusive structure. The black, students are the black students are giving me a rough time about the lack of transformation at the university. So I say, I hear this, and you might not hear this, so why don't you make the shift? He said, oh, God, Dr. King said we must look at the man's character, not his color. Now you're bringing up the race thing. <laughs> so I had to go to a class. I said, we, we need to continue to talk. It's clear that there's a big gap between us. The next day, they pulled the plug on my funding. <laughs> yeah. But so, I, yeah, and I'm not saying this to complain. I actually feel quite liberated because now I can do these other things that I really value. But I just think the conversation about racism is a difficult one because it's usually initiated by us. I suspect the conversation about gender and sexism in patriarchy is equally difficult because we as men are still in dominant positions and it's not usually an issue we would raise because we're not affected by it. And so then when the women raise it, it's then easy to blame them for raising it and give them, yeah, all sorts of names. 